During my research on Stoßdruck tactics, usually called Stormtrooper tactics in English, I come across several misconceptions and myths and I thought I'd make an extra video to address them. So let's get started. At number one, they were developed by General von Hutier. Now what is the background for this? In 1918, during the German Spring Offensive, the Kaiserschlacht, the Germans advanced several miles in a matter of days, and this was rather unheard of for quite some time on the Western Front, especially since the Germans since mid-1916 were basically on the defensive all the time. So when the French and the British looked at the situation, they needed some kind of explanation, and Samuel Mark notes that they came up with the great genius theory, the great man myth. So basically there was one mastermind that orchestrated everything and they looked at one of the army commanders and it was General von Hutier. And so this came into context. The problem is those tactics were mostly developed by junior officers and also locally. So they were developed very differently, not from one genius at the top, but from, from direct experience on the front line. So in other words, it was basically just one excuse. Which brings us to myth number two. The Stormtrooper tactics were developed secretly in the East. Now this goes hand in hand with the von Hutier myth. Basically there's the some explanation why the Germans could suddenly advance so rapidly. And it was usually, an unusual example was the Battle of Riga from 1917, where the Germans had a major success. But if you look closer at the battle, it happened mostly on the operational level, the important aspect. And another point is that some authors point out that the stormtrooper tactics had very little influence on the battle and that it was basically classical warfare on the Eastern Front from the very get-go. Lundorf also notes that basically on the Eastern Front we could fight like we trained basically before the war, of course with some adaptions, but for the most part the stormtrooper tactics were needed for the Western Front statement, not for the Eastern Front. Now the question is, if it didn't happen on the Eastern Front and it wasn't von Hutier, maybe it was a Frenchman? Which brings us to myth number three, that Lafargue invented the stormtrooper tactics. Now here initially there's some evidence. In 1915 he wrote the pamphlet, The Attack in Trench Warfare, and it got into the hands of Marshal Foch and it was published commercially in 1916. So the Germans could get their hand on it because it was basically publicly available. The problem is the Germans also released several publications and some predate the works of Lafargue. Additionally, Stephen Ball notes, if you look at what is written in the pamphlet, it is not about small unit tactics, it's more about the big pushes which were done at the Somme and were done in 1916 and it doesn't resemble the battles of Saint Quentin or Lys in 1918. So now very important here before you take out your Pickelhaube and Bratwurst, wait for it. Basically all these tactics were, were influencing each other all the time. Often they quoted each other in the manuals and everything. So each side looked at the development of the other side and reacted to each other. One author notes an involuntary cross fertilization in terms of tactics and doctrine development that happened in the First World War. So as always, nothing really develops in a vacuum. At number four, the stormtroopers had less losses than regular units. Now some claim that the stormtroopers had less losses than regular units, while others state that they had disproportionately high losses. Which is true? Well, it really depends how you look at it. Do you look at the whole duration of a war? Or do you look at specific points in time? Now, first off, an argument for less losses is usually they were highly trained and qualified men with very hard requirements, so only the best were selected and of course they were the special tactics. Now first off, yes most stormtroopers were initially very well qualified and highly trained. The thing is later on they became common tactics. And then in 1918 the manpower of Germany was severely depleted so quite often some people that performed stormtrooper tactics we had far different qualifications than before, yet usually they were still the best in a company or a division we were selected for these missions. So yeah, in overall they were better qualified and more motivated, but the high requirements like below um, the age must be below 25 years and non-married, they were only for the original very early 
battalions and also the training battalions. Now, the other aspect is these units trained usually for a very long time and to a certain degree at, a, at one point they were only mainly training battalions as well. So there of course you have less losses. But when they faced combat it was usually a high intensity combat where they faced more losses. Another very interesting aspect is they had a very high amount of losses during training. They even lost officers during training which shows how harsh the training was and how close to reality basically it was as well. Now we have some numbers here and Bull notes that for the Sturmabteilung or Sturm Battalion later Roar it was 620 fatalities over the duration of the war. Of course this is very important. It was a, a Sturm detachment first and then it got upgraded to battalion. So it was not always a full battalion. Additionally it wasn't started in 1914 like the other other units we have a comparison. Then he lists two regiments, the losses, and divides them up to the battalion. So we have average losses for two German battalions from about 1000 to 1200 in fatalities again. And he also looks at a British battalion which had 729 killed in action and missing in action. Some of them returned from, from prisoners of war camp later on, but as you can see, the losses for the regular units are higher, but the pro problem is the raw unit was smaller and of course it was also not developed um, in 1914, it was not ready. So you could basically argue both. I would say if you were in a, a stormtrooper unit, the chances that you would get killed were definitely higher, especially since these men were also way higher trained. So yeah. It really depends how you look at it. Do you look at, at what do you look at a point in time at a specific battle? Their losses were probably very much higher than for a regular unit. But if you look on the longer aspect, yeah, as you can see on the numbers, they might have been uh, statistically a safer spot on the Western Front, but I doubt it. Myth number five: Stormtrooper tactics were pure wartime development. Now this myth is not only focused on the stormtrooper tactics. You could say it's a channel myth or even a meta myth for the whole first world war. Quite often people look back and state, oh back then they were all idiots, they didn't know what they were doing, they were ignoring the developments, they didn't see the importance of the machine gun and of the artillery and other aspects. Now here's a very important part, I call this usually a hindsight warrior myth or a hindsight warrior point of view. You should not forget that these men usually were highly trained professionals and they had usually quite a lot of combat experience, command experience or other experience in that regard, general staff training and other aspects. So they were clearly not idiots for the most part of it and afterwards, yeah, being in hindsight everyone is way smarter, especially more like 100 years later. Now here a very important aspect we need to consider. Information back then passed very slowly. If you compare it to nowadays, if I want to know how long a Gewehr 98 was, well it takes me 5 to 10 seconds with a smartphone. A smartphone I can use probably on like 50 to 90 percent of the planet and get the information instantly if I have cell coverage. So this compared this to, to 1918 or 1914 or something. You had to go to a library to get a book or a field manual, somewhere that it is written down. This also means you need to know where the library is, when it's open, to find the book and everything around. So this usually would take you a few hours if not days. The same is with all information transferred. I mean we are especially talking here in, in some certain aspects about highly confidential information. So you couldn't pass it along so easily but there was no email. Phone, yeah, still there, but most important stuff was in written form. So basically the development of everything back then, what nowadays can take probably minutes, back then could take days or even weeks or months. Everything was way slower. Now you could say, well, but if you, if you really go fast, you can do it. I think 
you need to look at this this way. You are going on a, on a pedestrian walk and there are hundreds of people in front of you and hundreds of people behind you. Try to run. It's not gonna work because everyone else will in a way block you, not voluntarily, but because everything is so slow. So also the thinking and the whole approach to everything was way slower because there was no necessity and also no, no possibility to basically exploit it. So this was way before, before computers and way before the internet. I still had computers without internet. They were great machines, but compared with the computer, not, but nowadays if I have a computer without internet access, it's basically for me a, a, a typewriter or a piece of wood or metal more appropriately. So this is very different and you need to consider this that basically back then everything was way slower. Now let's get back to the stormtrooper tactics. Ralf Ratz, a German military historian, did his thesis about this and he looked at the regulations and publications from 1906 to 1918. And he basically states in his conclusion that nearly all except one development were foreseen already in the pre-war literature. Basically that the squad will become more important and the platoon and company less, that the NCO will be a combat specialist and more important, that strong preparations for an attack were necessary, so proper planning, that fire superiority would be very important and other aspects. There was only one aspect which wasn't dis discussed thoroughly in the literature back then and this was the change from the importance of the rifle to close combat weapons and that the combat will be way fought in way close quarters. This was the only thing in the German literature which was not foreseen before the war, which also connects to the third myth, basically, that nothing develops in a wake room. So I hope you learned something new. Thank you for watching and see you next time.